for more than 100 years. From the mid-1800s until the Second World War, they travelled the world in search of people. Human beings they classified as exotic animals to be exhibited in human zoos. These exhibitions were a worldwide phenomenon. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, some 35,000 human beings were exhibited to one and a half billion other human visitors. Human beings exhibited by other human beings. In zoos, in circuses, theatres and anatomy rooms. At colonial exhibitions and world fairs. These men and women were placed on the same level as animals. This was extremely disturbing. At the same time, there was a degree of conditioning which was very difficult to escape from. Children, women and men were put on display in order to support a hierarchy of races and to justify worldwide colonization. It was so successful because people came to see the so-called savages from faraway lands, whose exoticism had long fascinated them. Here, for the first time, they could be marveled at in the flesh. They were supposed to depict cannibals, although none of them actually were cannibals. It was all just theater. Thanks to human zoos, racism became accepted and commonplace. Visitors flocked to see the ever more terrifying savages, which were marketed accordingly. Tambo, an Aborigine from Australia, Otto Benga, a pygmy from Congo, Marius Kalui, a Kanak from New Caledonia, and Moliko, a Kailinya from Guyana. They represent many thousands of people who were exhibited, but whose names history has forgotten. Remembering is not about attaching blame to people. Remembering is, above all, about understanding what happened and understanding the influence these actions have had on all of us. mass entertainment, human exhibitions were reserved for the elite. As early as the 16th century, Europeans imported strange savages from far-flung lands for the enjoyment of rich aristocrats at royal courts. But by the beginning of the 19th century, this fashion had spread to fairs, pubs and theatres, thereby reaching a wider audience. In the United States, the king of human exhibitions was Phineas Taylor Barnum. From as early as 1841, his famous freak shows had attracted huge crowds of people and had earned him a fortune. He wanted to put the strangest people in the world on stage. Dwarves, mermaids, conjoined twins, a bearded lady, a giant. They were all assembled in a gallery of the bazaar, where visitors could catch a glimpse of an amazing and fantastic world. Hollywood didn't yet exist, but Barnum was responsible for establishing a fascination for the strange. Barnum revolutionized the American circus when he created the greatest show on earth, a huge traveling circus with 5,000 seats. This was also where he presented his savages to the public. He wrote to more than 100 American commercial agencies and consulates throughout the world, asking them to send him real wild savages in order to increase his worldwide troop of what he called freaks. The Irishman Robert Cunningham was able to satisfy Barnum's wishes. <laughs> 
When he heard about Barnum's letter in 1883, he was in Australia, in North Queensland, home to the Aborigines, the country's indigenous people who had been oppressed by British settlers since the 18th century. Deprived of their most basic rights, victims of violence and racial segregation, they were considered little more than a part of the fauna and flora. Queensland wasn't a state then, it was a, it was a colony. This was a turning point for Aboriginal people who had been living here for thousands and thousands of years and countless generations because their land was being taken by Europeans. Aborigines were forced to live in villages called black camps. Cunningham met Kukamanwura, a young Aborigine man who he renamed Tambo. Tambo's companions were also given new names. Toby, Jenny, and their son, Toby Jr. Billy, Susie, Jimmy, and Bob. The prevailing pseudoscientific ideology ranked Aborigines the lowest amongst the hierarchy of human races, making them highly sought after for human and folk shows. They were considered unsuited to modern life and facing extinction. I do know that not long after Cunningham got them on the boat from Townsville, they wanted to go back to their communities. They wanted to go home. We know that the people was not aware of um, what they were getting themselves involved with. Cunningham actually had to remove all their clothes so they wouldn't run away. When they got into Sydney, two people actually still escaped. One of them actually stabbed a policeman. The whole matter ended up before the court. The judge still released the two escapees into the care of Cunningham through a bond. In the wake of this upset, the group hastily boarded a ship in Sydney, and after a long crossing, they joined the greatest show on earth in New York. Barnum had prepared his new acquisitions to be the highlight of his show. He created a backstory for each of them and gave them roles to play. Cower before Billy the Hunter and his terrifying scars succumb to the charms of Susie, Princess of Queensland. Experience the thrill as fierce warrior Tambo performs his sensational war dance. The tour traveled across America at breakneck speed. The troops' appearance in more than 130 American and Canadian cities pushed them to exhaustion while Barnum and Cunningham made a fortune. I can only imagine coming from a remote island in North Queensland to be paraded in front of 30,000 people, the horror they were feeling to be exhibited down. So in a strange land, strange people, strange noises, smells, of, um, God knows how they were feeling. In 1884, one year after arriving in America and having traveled the whole country, Tambo fell ill and died while still on tour. Cunningham had the body mummified and sold his remains to a fairground museum in Cleveland. More deaths followed in quick succession. However, the show went on. Despite these losses, Cunningham knew his troop could conquer Europe. He shipped them to London, the capital of human zoos. In London, they performed nightly at the Crystal Palace, which was constructed in 1851 for the Great Exhibition. I'm not sure whether the visitors at that time had enough distance to say to themselves, this is a business, it's not really real, but just acting. I don't think that the distance was there, and that's the dangerous thing. 
after England, the Aborigines set out on an extensive tour through the old world theatres and music halls. Castel's Panopticum in Berlin, the Arcadia in St. Petersburg, the Folie Berger in Paris, where the last survivors were photographed. Jenny and Toby Jr., who would both contract tuberculosis. The face of Billy, Tambo's companion, is unknown. The eyes of Billy are very sharp. So you just, just wondering where he is, just looking at him, and he's confused. It's a depressed feeling. And it, it, low, low, low steam, self-esteem. You know, going overseas into another world, you know, he's been stripped of his powers in the sense of uh, he's been humiliated because he's dominated by somebody else who's telling him what to do. In our society, he was respected as a lawman, but now he's not. And then you see that. With the support of the Australian government, Granddad Walter has brought home the mortal remains of his ancestor, Tambo, so that he can finally rest in peace on Palm Island among his people. Tambo's mummified body had been found in 1993 in the United States in the basement of a funeral home in Cleveland, Ohio. I feel strong because of uh, his back on his uh, ancestral country. I feel his strength and his spirit's back home now. And he's free. He's free. The story needs to be told um, purely because the mistakes of the past don't revisit us in the future. When exoticism was all the rage, show organisers were not the only ones to grasp the interest that the exhibitions aroused. The colonial powers saw a ready opportunity to introduce to their citizens both their colonies as well as the validity of their imperialist policies. At the end of the 19th century, a renewed impulse to colonize developed in the West that prompted the European powers, but also the US and Japan, to freely divide among themselves those territories still available. In particular, Africa. The world was gradually appropriated by those who saw themselves as uniquely civilized. At the same time, human zoos proliferated to justify colonial domination of the world. Colonized people have to accept, share, and promote their own myth. And that is exactly what happened in colonial times. Not only in Africa, but also in Japan and elsewhere. In order for the savage to exist, those who are presumed to be savages must accept that, that it is indeed exactly what they are. At the beginning of the 1890s, the role of the human zoos was shifting in response to political objectives which were masterly staged and orchestrated. Moliko's story is that of a survivor. After months of humiliation, she was able to return to her village and her people. A hundred years later, her descendants recall the suffering of the exhibited people and shed light on their trauma. <laughs> 
Moliko and her companions belong to the Kalinya people, natives of Guyana. In 1882, Moliko, together with other people in her village, left the banks of the Moroni River and Guyana accompanied by the sound of drums. She and 32 others had volunteered to undertake the journey to Europe. The old people told us that there was a big party before departure. They still remember a mast and that the ship gradually disappeared over the horizon. Until then, they could still see what was happening. But when the ship was beyond the horizon, there was silence. The French explorer, Francois Laveau, sent by the military for colonies, was able to convince the Caligna to head off into the unknown. He offered them money and beautiful sights and vouched that they would be well treated. When Coast travel companions were men, women and children who came voluntarily but were locked up in cages. They were supposed to make pottery in Paris and build dugouts. Instead, they were forced to act as savages for the audience and were doubly humiliated in the process. They were not accepted for who they were and they quickly realized that they are indeed regarded as savages. Subjected to constant humiliation, the Kalinia, like all other people exhibited at the time, were subjected to racialist scientific studies. The exhibition of the Kalinia was a great success. The public flocked to the Jardin d'Acclimatation. The Kalinia embodied to perfection what human savages were meant to be like. The winter, disease and exhaustion rapidly caused the deaths of some members of the troupe in Paris. The show continued nonetheless. Of the original 32 Kalinia who travelled to France, only 10 returned to their village. Moliko was one of them. This part of the Kalinia history is very distressing because the people could not mourn their loss. Grief is something very important for the Kalinia people, and even a century later, it is still impossible to mourn. Caroline and Lydia are mother and daughter. They are direct descendants of Moliko. They have never seen these photos of Moliko and her fellow companions of misfortune taken by Roland Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. That's Moliko. That was her great-grandmother's first name. She was called Moliko. We don't know who the other one was. She said they were afraid when they reached France. That's what she said when she told me what happened. I feel sorry for them back then. I feel sad. Then? When I look at these photos, my father never talked about his grandmother leaving. I've never seen these photos. But I can look at them now. This unspoken trauma is something the descendants still struggle with today. I don't think it was right. What was the point? The way the white people made them do all this nonsense? What did they want with them? Such behavior is mistreatment. If a white man takes them away, he must treat them properly. Such treatment was simply not correct. They wanted to force their will on the Kalinya. But maybe they didn't obey. Maybe that's what happened. <laughs> 
Nobody really knows what happened back then. There is no textbook or course about indigenous history. And to date, no historian has dealt with this aspect. Yet it is part of our identity, but also a facet of the history of France. That's why we are interested in it today. The exhibition of the Caligna was an important first step towards a state exploitation of the colonised people for propaganda purposes. The Ministry of Colonies took control of human exhibitions. All private shows now needed its authorisation. The production spread across the Atlantic. America was now also getting involved. Of all the people's exhibited, one stood out in terms of popularity. Six diminutive Africans attracted everyone's attention. They were Batwa pygmies from the Belgian Congo. The St. Louis Anthropology Department had financed an African expedition led by the explorer Samuel Werner to bring them to be presented exclusively at the exhibition. Otterbenga was one metre 41 in height. This young man with the enigmatic smile was soon to become the most popular among them. Samuel Werner was commissioned explicitly to bring back pygmies because it was believed uh, at that time that they were the least civilized people on the planet. And so uh, the whole point of the St. Louis World's Fair was to map human progress from the lowest to the highest with the pygmies said to represent the lowest form of humanity. Since 1885, the Congo had been the property of the Belgian King Leopold II. His authority was unchallenged and his rule was particularly violent and harsh. Acts of brutality were commonplace. Samuel Werner himself said how he captured the pygmies. He wrote about how the people were crying as he was like loading these people on to the ships and how some got away. He also indicated how he had gone into villages with force. He was armed and he had the consent and the support of a brutal regime to exercise his mission. Of all the so-called specimens presented at the exhibition, the pygmies aroused the greatest curiosity among the visitors they represented absolute savagery. Their small stature was due to a morphological adaptation to living in the equatorial rainforest. But according to Westerners, it signified that they were subhuman. They saw in them the confirmation of man's descent from apes, proof of Darwin's famous theory of the missing link between man and animal. Day after day, Otterbenga was treated to the Americans' vulgarity and contempt. Otterbenga's teeth were probably most responsible for the horrendous experience he had in the United States because of his teeth, which were chipped to points. It's a very common practice in the Congo. This imagery validated this idea that he had been a cannibal, and of course he was not. This deception consummated Samuel Werner's success. He received the St. Louis Gold Medal at the closing ceremony of the exhibition, which had attracted almost 20 million visitors. After traveling to the Congo again, the explorer finally took Otto Benga to New York. His American adventure had resumed, but behind bars. It was 1906. Samuel Werner was unable to provide for his pygmy, so he loaned him to the head of the Bronx Zoo, who put him in a monkey cage. 
he was made to play the savage with bow and arrow as props. In a few short years, more than 40,000 people came to see him in an enclosure he shared with a chimpanzee, his new partner with whom he performed small tricks. There's an outcry in the press, and not just the African-American press, but increasingly in the mainstream press, that this is so degrading and so contrary to what a civilized nation should be doing that zoo authorities, together with some of the ministers um, in New York, uh, work out an arrangement to have Benga conveyed to an orphanage. Now free and in the care of a religious community, Otto Benga hoped finally to be able to integrate into his adopted country. The black ministers who took him in in 1910 gave him a Western Christian education. He went to primary school and took English lessons. Subsequently, he was sent to Lynchburg, Virginia, where he got to know Ann Spencer, a respected African-American poet and civil rights activist. She taught him to write. Protected and supported, Otabenga tried to live a normal life and go to work. But as a Congo pygmy, he could not adapt to the country of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, the end of the story is uh, the First World War breaks out and it's clear to Benga that it's going to be very, very difficult to get back to the Congo. And we don't know exactly what precipitated his action, um, but you know, he takes his own life. He um, uh, has a gun and leaves his residence and uh, shoots himself through the heart. <laughs> At the time of his death, 12 years after coming to the United States, he was the most famous savage in American show business. His body was never claimed by the Congo. Otabenga's story is the story of racism. The thousands of people who stared at Otabenga failed to see a human being. We can see how throughout history these men and women have been denied their humanity in order to justify the alleged superiority of white people. set attitudes towards exhibiting people and to colonial operations. The two great powers, Britain and France, chose out of economic and military opportunism to enrol people from their colonies. They now believe they can be civilized and useful if they can be kept under supervision. Yesterday's savages were today's brave soldiers or indigenous workers. In the eyes of the countries they fight for, they are now fighting an even more primitive savage, the Germans. After victory was achieved, Afro-Caribbean, Hindu, African-American, Kanak, African and Asian soldiers from the French and the Allied armies paraded on the Champs-Élysées to the cheers of the crowds. The human exhibitions after 1918 are different. Now they are no longer savages. Of course, they remain natives and are not our equals, but they no longer live in darkness. They are on the road to civilization and are portrayed as being at the service of the great colonial nation. The pacification of these territories is staged with the help of folklore, exoticism, even eroticism. The result is a world that only functions due to the domination of the West. The message remains the same. We are the masters and they are the natives. Marios Kalawi was 21 when he agreed to leave his new Caledonian homeland to travel to Paris with a hundred fellow Canucks. 
It was 1931. He trusted the French official who suggested he and the others present their Kanak culture at the Colonial Exhibition in Paris. They were to return in eight months. Some 100 people agreed to undertake the journey, including teachers, students, customs officers, waiters and seamen. Little did they know that they would become the tragic heroes of one of the greatest humiliations in French history. In the Jardin d'Acclimatation, Marius was told he could not leave his enclosure unaccompanied to rest or pray. None of the promises made were kept. He had been tricked. It was as if he had returned to the 19th century. It was terrible. They had to perform from morning till night. The women had to breastfeed in public. They had to build dugouts and dance all day. They were slaves. I think that violates human dignity. Even though nobody died, people should not treat other people like that. Some of the troupe went to Germany, while twice a week the others performed at the Colonial Exhibition in Paris. The organizers exhibited them as natives from New Caledonia, as part of the colony's official presentation. Unlike in the Jardin d'Acclimatation, they were not presented as savages, but as bold natives of the empire. France wished to showcase the scope of an empire, which was at its peak with a population of 100 million and an area twice that of the Roman Empire. The colonial exhibition was two to three times the size of Disneyland in Paris, and it took place not outside, but in the center of Paris, in former workers' districts that had been completely redesigned. At that time, cinema was still in its infancy, sound film had just been invented, and here an entire colonial empire was now being recreated. It was like Hollywood. The exhibition was inaugurated by the President Gaston Dumergue and Masha Loyalté, joined by the Under Secretary of State for the Colonies, Blaise Diane. In just a few months, 33 million tickets were sold. I think 1931 was the peak. But that is not to say that a real decline was starting. It was important to show that France's history, which had cost a lot of money and countless parliamentary debates, had finally paid off. And that the promise of educating inferior people to a level not too far removed from the nation's standards had been achieved. All over the world, voices were beginning to denounce human zoos. For the first time, an enormous scandal erupted. In France, the Human Rights League, the Communists and even former colonists of New Caledonia were protesting. All agreed that such displays were unacceptable. You could not glorify the civilizing mission of colonization and at the same time exhibit fake savages. The Kanaks being exhibited in Germany also started rebelling and were less and less willing to play the game. The protests prompted the Minister of Colonies to order the Jardin d'Acclimatation to close the exhibition and to bring back part of the troop in Germany at Hagenbeck. At stake was the honour of the French Republic, which could not be seen to be condoning such productions. The authorities decided to repatriate the troop. The Canucks arrived home in July 1932. Marius Calloway did not wish to return. 
He saw his future in France and refused to board the ship in Marseille and returned to the woman he loved. She was French, her name was Juliette Gabrielle Favre, and meeting her was the only good luck he'd had in France. A few weeks later, the couple married in Bordeaux. What is surprising is that the marriage contract here says the future wife wishes to keep her French nationality. Because Canucks were considered to be foreigners, even though they came from a French colony. Sylvette was born one year later. She was only a few months old when Marius died in a tram accident. Her family always hid the fact that her father was a Kanak. Only in her old age did she discover her origins, thanks to a journalist friend. Today, Sylvette has returned to the zoological gardens where her father was exhibited. It's a French, but also a New Caledonian story. I'm proud because he was my father, but the way he was treated is shocking. It's not a very nice story, especially as I never got to know him. This place touches me. I have the feeling that these people are always present here. Sauvette arranged for Marius's remains to be returned to New Caledonia in 2006. Today, he rests among his people in Natalo Cemetery on the island of Lifu. We returned by ship and took him to the tribe. They prepared food. The children sang. Everyone spoke about his story. He has returned. He's back home. The exhibition of the Canucks was one of the last in Europe. The scandal was so great that such shows were no longer possible. In the decade prior to the Second World War, human zoos and colonial exhibitions gradually ceased. The last of such exhibitions took place at the end of the decade in Britain, Portugal, Germany and Italy. They were no longer profitable. The public was tired of them. Only a few diehards hung on, but their productions were so blatantly mediocre that visitors shunned them. The end of human zoos marked the start of revolts heralding decolonization wars. To abandon the zoos was to abandon colonial domination. A new era had begun, but one of conflict and suffering. The next 20 years from 1940 to 1960 would be the darkest and most violent of the 20th century. The Second World War, decolonization, the revolts against segregation in the United States, a wave of violent struggles swept all over the world. This long chapter of history really only concluded when the colonies won their independence from the mid-1950s through the mid-1970s. From there onwards, the West will try by any means to erase this shameful past. The history of the human zoos is forgotten because it belongs to the history of folk culture and not to the great colonial history. The researchers of the 50s to 80s found this phenomenon completely irrelevant. Today, we're beginning to rediscover all this and ask ourselves the simple question, how could people in the West believe that human beings on the other side of the oceans were all savages? 
In the mid-1990s, scientists and museum directors began to open the crates, search the archives, and even to exhume remains. It is important to study the past in order to understand what is happening in the present. For example, if you want to understand why racism exists in our societies, you only have to look at the human zoos, the history of colonization and slavery. Only then will you understand why there is still a claim for a superior domination today. To lay this past to rest, the bodies must rest in peace. Will we one day send home the bodies of the exhibited, as we did in the past with Tambo? Will we one day write down Moliko's story into the history books of Guyana and also France? Or that of Marios Calloway to overcome the conflicting memories that persist, not least in New Caledonia? What can we do so that one day the body of Otabenga is reclaimed by the Congo and written into the country's history? It is now the duty of a generation to rescue these stories from oblivion. Only by creating an enlightened culture of remembrance can we finally close the chapter on human zoos. <laughs>